Are you concerned about all this corruption being misgendered as conspiracies? Well, don't you worry. Sit back, relax, and join in the conversation as we talk with today's guest. Welcome to another LSB Film Productions podcast with your host, Chris Brooks. Hello and welcome to the show for another LSB podcast. Today, my guest is Alan Miller. Now, most of you will know Alan Miller because of the Together Project. Um, we're going to talk about things you les. We're going to talk about low emission zones. We're going to touch on the things which are going on in Brussels and Scotland. I'm going to give the floor to Alan. So welcome to the show, Alan. Well, thanks for having me, Chris, and thank, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate being here. Well, it's, yeah, it's been a busy time, and I think that... Um, you know, for a lot of people, uh, you know, there's a lot of frustrating things going on. The one thing that I always would look at, though, as well, is some of the impacts we are having and can have. And I'm going to keep coming back to that because it, it would be very easy just to think that, oh, it's just one way assault on all of us, you know, with increasing kind of measures on um on whether it's to do on protests, on free speech. You know, we've got the Hate Crime Act in Scotland. We've got the Online Safety Act. Uh, in in England or well, you know across the UK, um, but obviously there are measures that have been addressing free speech. Uh, there there are measures you know you you mentioned U layers and low emission zones and and obviously we know low traffic neighbourhoods as well. And we've had a lot of work uh, done, which people that would be watching your show and supporters around the country and lots of people have campaigned, uh, which has meant that the Department for Transport. And Mark Carper, the Transport Secretary, stopped funding uh, livable streets, active travel for low traffic neighbourhoods. There's been a review that the Prime Minister has had to do. We know that we, these reviews may not amount to much <laughs> sometimes, uh, but it has had an impact because it's had an impact electorally. We saw that in Uxbridge and also in the discussion around net zero and the questions for that and in terms of what people can actually achieve. And that's not just to say with elected representatives in places like Warrington and in Newcastle and a range of other places in Bristol and Bath, people, we've had meetings, people have asserted themselves and councillors and others have stepped back, right? When people, mm. or they've taken things out and they've forced them to be thrown out. And so we've had a lot of, uh, across the board, there's been sort of some really positive measures that if you look at the discussion, for instance, let's now talk about traffic measures and cars and freedom and mobility. Tens of thousands of people in the Midlands across Birmingham have not paid these clean air zones, they call it there, and they've had their challenges upheld. And similarly, uh, we've seen that, you know, um, the, the, the challenges against these things in different areas, people now recognise that they're not just individuated, but they're much more joined up. There's a kind of set of ideas that underpin a lot of them. A lot of them are related to the net zero clean air idea. What is it? How does you, Les, link to the low emission zone in Scotland and all of that? And, what you know, surprise, surprise, there's a few people saying, hey, this is what's best for all of you. They often meet, they're often quite international, global things. There's C40 cities, which Sadiq Khan is the chair of. There are, obviously, we know at COP26 and other places, a lot of these ideas around 15-minute cities and net zero and clean air and traffic limits and surveillance all get discussed. And at Davos and elsewhere. But really what this means is the people that are running things are very detached from people's everyday lives, from me and you and ordinary people who have to see their family, who have to go to work, why David Lammy can say, if you've got all these tools and you're a builder, get on the get on the train or get on the bus, you know, when we're talking about low traffic neighbourhoods or or 20 miles per hour. So there's been a big pushback and that's going to continue. But there's a lot of challenges. Right. So what we've been doing it together is we've been engaging with a lot of them up and down the country, working with groups. We've got local, regional and national uh, kind of ambassadors and supporters and groups. And we've just been in Scotland. Um, as you were saying. So that was really uh, a really incredible experience. I mean, I'm sure your guys know about what's happened with Humza Yusuf. And it's been like for three years, they've been looking to impose this hate crime bill, they called it. And it's been really difficult. They've been going back and forth and the police are like, well, how, how are we going to do that if it's deemed to stir up hate or deemed it's beyond offensive, right? And who gets to decide what's hateful exactly. and what isn't, you know? What? Exactly that. Oh, yeah, it's ridiculous. Like thought crime. Well, it is thought crime, isn't it? At the end of the day, it's, this is what Orwell talked about. This is exactly it. Like, 
Um, the idea that someone decides that it's hateful to say that bio biological sex is a reality and it matters, to then say that's hateful, something that has been understood by all of humanity for all of the time until we got here, till about a millisecond ago, yeah. then to say that somehow saying that is a, a bridge too far and that that's hateful and you're stirring up potential violence to people. And this is the other real difficulty. You see words are now words associated. Words spells. They're, so yeah, they're associated with actions and they're very different. And this is why the free speech thing and free expression is so important because actions under law in England in particular, you're accountable for your actions. So if you go and do something, if you rob something or if you hit someone, you are individually responsible. Now, that's very different to saying things unless you actually say oh like here's some money go do this or whatever but yeah, like, unless you're it, actually advocating yes now, so when you're actually commenting or talking about things that that free expression has to be uh unhindered and unlimited because without it we don't really have any of our other freedoms so they've the smp they've implemented this it's become an act and we were at together the together association we're doing two key events in glasgow and in aberdeen all about low emission zones, but actually partly the low emission zone. So it's also about free speech because we've seen in London with ULES that both the BBC and Sadiq Khan, the current mayor, have been smearing people by calling them far right who go on these protests, like decent people who've got a different viewpoint. They're very concerned about these charges. They're people, they're working people, and they've decided to you know have a voice and they get just kind of this smear and the BBC had to retract it and say, you know, sorry, basically, that wasn't right when we did a protest in Trafalgar Square. But this kind of shorthand that you go, oh, it's those people, right? Um, this contempt for the public. So what's happened is that, um, you know, it's in, in Scotland, they've been watching what's been happening in different cities in, in, in England and Wales, and they've kind of done it slightly differently, but not really. So... Um, really really strong events in glasgow we had some key people from hospitality donald mcleod and uh, and michael they've got kind of a number of really well-known venues there and they're like the kind of heart of the community and they bring business and trading the whole road was like dug up and you couldn't get around even to the building we were in it was a really good symbolic metaphor mm -hmm. of the problem and glasgow's had tens of thousands of less footfall and visits this year than they had last year, even after COVID, right? Even after the lockdowns. Because of these measures, these traffic limiting measures, there's like cycling lanes that are really wide that are empty the whole day, right? There's no one in there. But there are still potholes and they're still not maintaining the roads. And so you've got this whole thing and a lot of people are furious. And we had Penny Lewis from Dundee University speaking and Ben Powell, who did the Together report on clean air, looking at billionaires and the amount of influence they're having. And we're not having a proper debate because they have all these so-called grassroots movements like UK 100 in Britain. And people should look up UK 100, but the cycling campaign activists, they're all funded by a few people like Hone and others. Uh, and they, they who fund other things like Just Off on a range of things. And it's almost like even MPs and councillors don't often get to hear a full debate because those questions are a bit like, they get circumvented because you don't even get published. You don't even get research you don't in the academy because that's where all the funding is. It's a really important report that we did. And it's it's it followed on from the lie that Sadiq Khan's people said that 4,000 people were dying every year. And that's why we need you, Les. And we shredded that. And so these things as we go along are really, really important, Chris, right? Because you, we, we, it's not just an open door. They kick in and they just go through. But that's why we need people to kind of get engaged with us and to get stand up and get involved, become local leaders, do stuff and have our voices heard. Because the more we do that, there's actually these kind of authoritarian technocrats, they're petrified mm -hmm. when the public actually do that because it, you can have a disproportionate impact at the moment. And that was part of what we were doing in Scotland because in Glasgow and Aberdeen where we did these meetings, you could see that people were getting a sense, right, we've got people we've got in Inverness, in Dundee, in Edinburgh. This is exciting, right? There's a lot of people that are from a range of areas, the academy, from the business world, citizens, campaigners. Also, a lot of people with different views, right, that don't necessarily agree on everything, but we're grown up enough and big enough to know that there's some principles around these things that really matter. And we can have disagreements about different things, and that it doesn't mean that we're evil or we hate each other or that. Position. 
Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All, all these terms that people throw at people because we don't all just, we're not all singing as a choir, right? On every single issue. Well, echo chambers are never healthy, are they? Yeah. Really? Mm. That's right. And you have to have, you have to have the other side. You have to have the other point of view just to, even if it's just to enhance your own, you've, you've still got to have that conflating side because if not, it is, it does come across as then very manipulated, shall we say, you know. Well, also, we have to ask ourselves the question, do we want to uh, be in a minority who agree with each other all the time or do we want to reach out to the public, our fellow friends, citizens, colleagues, engage with them, not just call them names, but try and win them over to an idea that we think is important. Because if we don't, what we say is either we're not confident enough on our own ideas. So it's easy to call people names, mm -hmm. whether it's sheep or dumb. They call us names all the time. Other some of the people in power or like in the media, very very lazy and not helpful. But the most important thing is we're never going to convince people by doing that, right? We know what it feels like when people just say that. You just think, right, you're, you're mugging us off. So the thing is. But the really crucial thing is we have to hear those ideas and engage with the ideas we really find reprehensible and don't agree with. They have to hear us because not necessarily if we we're going to convince that particular person, but the people are listening and watching as well, also looking at all of that. And that's why the thrashing out of these ideas and people making these decisions about w which way to go and winning hearts and minds, that's really essential. And that's why back to Scotland, whilst these things are going on and people are doing name calling or censoring and we'll come on to things like the, the account of disinformation unit and some of the spy and censor units, right, because they've been in the news and other things that's happened. But just to talk about the Hate Crime Act, this we then went to Edinburgh, uh, we went then to Edinburgh. And this thing about people being from different views but coming together was really profound and really important there because you had people that were unionists that wanted Scottish independence. You had people that were Republicans, wanted the people that wanted to be part of uh, Great Britain, the United Kingdom that didn't like unionism at all. You, you, uh, I'm sorry, didn't like the, you know, the whole idea of independence. You had a whole range of different viewpoints. You had pastors uh, and people that were of faith and you had strongly secular people, people that were really like atheists. But the thing is, the unifying point was that we shouldn't have this really draconian measure imposed on everyone. No one asked for it in Scotland. It's been imposed. And we've now seen, right, that, like, obviously, <laughs> Yusuf's been reported by the most amount of people, which is kind of funny at one level, but, like, please, Scotland can't cope with burglaries. They're going to the same thing as we got in, in England and Wales, right? It's same. And yet, here, all of a sudden, we've got tens of thousands of reports that are going in. Malicious quite often. There, it's a bit like that Stalinist thing where you report your name or you're like, you know, the curtain twitching. Oh, they've gone out for a 10 minute longer walk than they should have done, you know, in like lockdown. That whole kind of nasty, like, well, we can't win the idea or whatever. So we'll just, we'll maybe report them. And we're, and you think, it's the, yeah. Go on, sorry. I oh, said, so, yeah, they're bootlickers. Yeah, and the thing is that it encourages that kind of thing. And then the police Scotland are overwhelmed with it all. And you're like, surprise, surprise, what did you think? And meanwhile, whilst all this is going on, a lot of this dynamic has been happening in the universities and schools for a while. So also some of the people that were there were the Scottish Union of Education who are doing some really important work talking about, you know, the, 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 the importance for the public and not just having these measures imposed on us and the need for parents to understand what's going on and not having just things done behind our backs. And, um, uh, you know, academics for academic freedom. And there's a range of other people that are all been involved in these discussions in Scotland and across Britain. And we're working with different people like we do with us for them and others that all uh, are concerned about young people. But, you know, our, our thing is we're concerned with all areas, right? You know, like we, we work with people that are doing stuff in care as carers, drivers who are like 37 million of us in the end, right? There's a lot of drivers in Britain, um, you know, from farming, people are farming and and citizens, citizens basically. Like the, the question that we've got together is when we have things, when we decide things, they should be based on what we need, what our interests are, what are the requirements? Not what some highfalutin idea about what should happen in the future with the world based on some models. You know, they got all these models. Yeah, where the models got us in twenty twenty yeah. onwards. Yeah.
But, I mean, it's, it's amazing because I would say, to be fair, the majority of people are probably on our side. The majority of people do think like we think, yeah. but you just don't hear about it as much. Yeah. So, I mean, what, I mean, one of the things is that it's certainly the case when you talked about echo chambers, that the, much of the media has a, you know, there's a certain representation, there's a certain bias. So, you know, one good example, bad example, Radio 4 today, yesterday, they did a piece on Paris and on cycling. And they're like, look how well it's been working. And their, their report, to be fair, was was OK when he was there, but it wasn't really any real question marks about it it was one a little bit but but then they get a, a, a representative from active travel on uh to talk about it in terms of britain and you know he's like a fawning advocate of shutting down our roads and having bollards and cameras he doesn't quite put it like that but roadblocks okay and he does it does in terms of health here we go again with the health thing right and all these measures were put in in, in, in emergency traffic orders they were like put through the land and um I suppose the thing is, it's always this idea that they need to do it to us, the stupid people, the backward people. And what we're saying it together is the public, who are the decent spy and the backbone of Britain, people who make it work every day, that we matter. We should be our concerns, whether it's energy, whether it's uh, education, whether it's employment, whether it's health. All of these should be about what we need, what's a reality. But most importantly, we should have a open honest dialogue a cost benefit analysis if everyone said well let's just shut our roads we'll have horses or we'll just walk everywhere if a majority said that and you had a proper debate and you went, yeah well you know it's going to mean we won't maybe have all these other things that's one thing right but that's never what happens the consultations are bogus they don't go out to people when they do go out people say oh you would the- have been predetermined yeah, or like Khan says, it's the wrong type of people responding. You can't, I mean, they're the ghoul of these people, right? You can't I think make... The thing they've also got to bear in mind is Britain Britain has an ageing population and we have the most atrocious weather. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, France's, their weather climate is much better than ours normally, I would say, per year. And so even they have, if you were younger, I could understand it more. But when you've got old people with ill health in bad weather, a lot of these ideas just don't work. Well, also, what they don't talk about is, so he talked about Mayor Hidalgo and putting it through. There was lots of challenges, and and it is true, it has changed. But Paris and the conurbations and the uh, areas as you go out further are all very different. So the strata goes out like that, and you've got Ban Louise, you've got different areas, and the suburbs are different to the centre. And in the centre, you can kind of lock things off. But it was part of the discussion that Carlos Moreno put forward for 15 minute cities and this idea that you have this thing. And it's now lots of people think, oh, it's our conspiracy theory. It's in planning. It's been around for a long time, 15 minute city. And and an idea could work in principle. If you said, right, we're going to provide all these services and we're going to have all these great things for people, all this public transport. And so then it would mean, right, I've got things close to me. I get that. Right. That's cool. Fair enough. But that's not what, happens with it what happens is you get the surveillance cameras and you get the bollards and you get the fines and they say well we haven't got those other things and they say yeah Yeah. you're like well all right so what you've got is something completely different and that's partly the whole thing about surveillance society with fines and uh, impositions regulation and you you know i love cycling and i love walking but as you say not everyone can do that and we never agreed to give up our Uh, freedom and mobility and the point about having a car is it gives you a certain amount of freedom to exercise your judgment particularly when you're out of central london once you start getting out to other places where there's where the um public transport is not there properly and and that's why in america it represented freedom really symbolically because once you start going over distances if you're a mother with kids or if you're a carer or if you've got family or if you're just working all of these things and if you just or if you just want to enjoy going to visit people right but once you you know that is what it and it, it just first it's really expensive to travel by train and then car and then if you've got things with you and that your timetables and strikes and, and and we know all of that right so this assault on the idea of the toxic polluter it's really the idea of the toxic human we're not the right kind of humans mm-hmm. and that's why we keep saying it together our interest got to come first right you know and that's why we say we have to have a pledge on net zero to transparency to see how this has all come about and every mp 
with regards to the party and every councillor should be signing that and agreeing to it. And every ele we should ask everyone who's standing as a candidate, because it's obviously election year. In May the 2nd, we got like all these mayors and devol de devolved cities and as well as some local councils. And then when we've got the general election, we should be putting this to them. We've also got a no to net zero campaign that sort of says, you know, we're challenging net zero, a lot of its assumptions and impositions. And the fact is that we need to get on top of how we deal with energy, uh, infrastructure and our needs, not some bright spark ideas about the future, which the rest of the world, the, the dominant ones who are doing things are not doing. And so there's there's kind of an, on a range of these areas we're campaigning, right, in terms of carers, in terms of what's been going on with cash and central bank digital currency and with ids we did a lot of campaigning with the you know the bank of england and others and the consultation and ongoing also from deplatforming people and um in in each of these areas what we've been trying to do is kind of engage with people bring new people in but I, the more that the public has its voice heard the more of an impact we can have and we've seen that somewhat with the deplatforming conversation but we've got to be honest and real, right? We've just seen in Brussels, it's not Britain, but it's Brussels, that the mayor decided it would be a good idea to say that um, Suella Braverman and Nigel Farage and some other people that were speaking in Brussels should have the event shut down because they were far right and didn't have the right kind of ideas. And, you know, Suella Braverman, I mean, it's, you, you, now some people who might be more, that might hate those ideas might cheer, but we should all remind ourselves that, once we start allowing people to say they've got the wrong ideas so they can't have a meeting and you start trying to cancel them, we're all doomed yeah. because that is the, the that is the point in which no one gets to speak. And you might enjoy it for a millisecond when someone you don't like doesn't. But we we have to hear the ideas that we, we abhor and we find reprehensible. And that was a, a terrible moment, right? You're thinking like, you just look at that. It doesn't matter what people think about Victor Orban or anything else, right? It's, or, or Nigel, right? It doesn't matter. What matters is that you've got to be able to have confidence in a free freedom and a freedom of exchange and a democratic. I know a lot of people go, oh, democracy, don't. But like in that we have, because the you alternative. You have to have debate. Yeah. You must have debate. Yeah. If, you know, even down to, I don't know, racism, you have to have a debate because if not, it goes underground and it becomes a much bigger problem. Yeah, well, particularly on racism and on everything, on all the issues that are controversial and all the issues that, because this is the other thing, it's the myth that they say that the majority of people in Britain are hateful and spiteful and toxic. And actually in Britain, we've had a far better experience of uh, bringing people in, accommodating, working and integration and living and, and sharing and having mixed uh, relationships than uh, most other countries. And that's the whole thing. I mean, during Brexit, no one really, you know, it was a caricature because actually the whole idea of Europe, if you really want to boil it down, they were very antagonistic to the idea of people outside of their borders coming in, right? So they're just a bit, oh, you're racist because you don't like the EU. You're like, well, you've got to be crazy. Have you done any work on this? Have you looked? But also, people are concerned about things like resources, about borders, about migration. And you have to have an honest conversation about it, right? And we have to address these things. You can't just write off, which is what people are doing, right? The majority of the British people by saying, oh, no, those ideas now, that just means you're beyond the pale. You're, you're, you're far right. You're racist. And, you know, so that's the thing. I think the thing is, if we can all encourage through the work we all do. I'm talking about like when you we talk to our work colleagues or when we talk to our neighbours and we just get a little spark and we engage them. Everything from that right through to we do lots of calls to action. So uh, approaching the MPs, writing them emails, going to their surgeries, talking to the local press, organising rallies, protests, meetings, getting the press involved, a range of, you know, and bringing people in to kind of recruit them, literally to become supporters and members, because people like, where would you get your money from? We get our money from people that are around us that believe in what we're doing, right? We don't mm -hmm. have donors that, that, like most of these big entities have. We have people that believe, and it was born out of the whole struggles with the lockdowns and the, you know, the, the attempt to have papers, please, vaccine passports. That's where we've come from, yeah. and people that are committed to see that we were challenging it. And there's a responsibility we've all got, right? It's not just together or the people like. But like everyone, if we want, we got to ask ourselves, what kind of country do we want to see? 
what kind of society do you want to see? Because we should remember that our friends in Australia and Canada and the States and elsewhere, right, Italy, you know, when this was all going on during lockdown, they were looking at us and they were like, there's no way you're going to stop the mandate. Good luck. But Because they were under so much pressure all around. We remember those scenes with, you know, in Victoria, Melbourne, and it was just unbelievable, right, some of those things. And yet we managed collectively, lots of people from the NHS, lots of frontline workers, other groups and us, we all managed to get it stopped. And when that stopped, almost everything slowed down and started changing and around the world. And so the thing is, obviously, there's all sorts of reasons. Partly they had a capacity question. They obviously objectively realised it, but they were on the smash. And here we all stood up. And it's really, really essential that we understand our own power because there's a lot of time people think, oh, it's just inevitable. It's just going to happen this way. Nothing you can do. They're all, And they're like self-fulfilling arguments. You tell mm. yourself that enough. It's kind of doing their job for them, right? So what we try and do is repose that whole thing and say, let's get out in our community. We've been flyering. We've been going by elections. We're doing a host of events now in the next coming months around the country in the Northeast and the Northwest. We've got our big Westminster. It's so funny saying it, but we're our big Westminster event in September again with our AGM annual general last week last year we had two thousand people in there and it was a message to all those guys it's just before the conferences right the, the, the labor and conservative and lib dems do their conferences it's like you know there's a different way everyone it's not like how they've all been doing it and being contemptuous about people just wheeling out the vote and there and we're all having an impact on them but we need to be better stronger more so that's really where we're at and what we're trying to do and you know, i really encourage everyone to get involved it's togetherdeclaration.org or at together deck but you know to 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 get involved no absolutely you know i've often said this and i think i've said it on the last couple of podcasts that i've done with other people like i'll have people email me saying oh it's a really good a really good um podcast you did but you keep asking the same questions but we're not seeing any action but my argument is well all we can do is spread awareness of what's going on, but then it's up to the viewer to then use that information and act on it. You know, like you said, we've all got to take responsibility for ourselves and our our own lives and our own towns and cities. You know, it can't you can't rely on just the same group of people trying to change the world. It takes a collective effort. And yeah. so yeah i fully agree with you well, that's absolutely true. just to say it's worth lingering on that for a moment every single thing that we've ever have had happen from yeah, emancipation of the vote both for men who are under a certain age and weren't property owners and for women in this country right the way through every question of our freedom to speak and what we call civil liberties now and civil rights none of them came about by smart people thinking it would be a good thing that the masses should have them they all came about by people very bravely putting themselves on the line and the free speech thing in particular but they're all uh, crucial because with the free free speech people have had all sorts of dreadful things done to them in the past historically you look back at the history of free speech in england and then what we, battles we fought even in our own kind of memories and our families and our grandparents in the second world war and all these things like we're standing on the shoulders of many people who put their lives sacrificed themselves and gave to the idea of freedom and commitment and it's always been a an idea that was fraught with issues it's always been a back and forth somewhat more authoritarian somewhat more freedom it's like the the debates between those early founding fathers and the constitution right those big debates between jefferson and Adams and, and, and Madison and all of them, are, you know, need more controls on them. And others would be more open and think we can exercise judgment. But the thing is, we have no one to blame if we don't do what we think needs to happen. And that is it, right, in the end. So that's the what we're constantly trying to do is try and encourage people to do that and also say to policymakers and to the media and all that, the public and our interest should be front and centre. The more that we can get more people doing that, the bigger impact we have. This next election, certainly in the mayoral elections, majority of people are not going to vote. And even in the general elections, many people are not voting. They're not voting because they're disillusioned, they're disappointed, dissatisfied. They think everyone just speaks the same. And 
that is a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. I'm not saying that voting is the one big thing. Do you think that? Do you think that's become a a, a thing because of design? Do you think that it's purposely been put that all these parties have? That, well, again, going back to Orwell, where all the politicians are just so corrupt that it is purposely made that way. Is so people go, oh, you know? No, what? I don't. I tell you what. I think that if you look at the history of in the modern period of the political establishments and the Conservative Party is the oldest, they keep telling everyone, the oldest and most successful one and all that. But the Lib Dems, you know, the Whigs, the, the role of the Labour Party, how it came about, that was through sincere people who had particular ideas, right? So Conservatives thought there'd be a small state, they believed in the market economy, uh, Labour believed more in the kind of nationalised... But these were not disingenuous people. They were committed and they were smart and they were bright. But the big debates were re really about the economy and about the state. The economy and the state and how much one trusted that or not or the individual or not, they were the big debates. Going back to Adam Smith and Hayek and Milton uh, uh, Friedman and Milton uh, and Keynes... And you, uh, John Maynard Keynes, you had this situation where these were big ideas that people are committed to. And really for a couple of hundred years, uh, really actually since the Enlightenment over the last few hundred years that people were fighting towards the idea. Once we'd had our revolutions, like the English Revolution, the French ones made it not an, just an aristocratic society, but where people could engage in the modern world as individuals. All these ideas are up for grabs. And it was absolutely not um, just are set up by a few people. Now, what it always has been is that there always has been nervousness about the mob and the masses. It's why the House of Lords was enshrined. It's why you got the Senate in America still, because they didn't trust commoners, the grubby little people. There was always that kind of patrician view. Plebs. Yeah, they've got everyone, Cromwell and all of that, right? Even when you had the English Revolution, you had these like new merchant leaders transforming things, getting rid of the old aristocratic order, right? But then they look around and they've implemented all this and they've got and they go, oh, well, hold on, actually. Let... Now, that debate is still raging on, right? We might not, we're not very historic anymore. No, really so... But those questions about do we trust ourselves and one another, which is what this all boils down to, who do we trust? Do we trust ourselves and our community? Can we exercise judgment? Can we can we do can we create a good life and can we do that? Or do we need patricians to do it for us? That is all still the debate. Now the thing is that the Labour Party is very clear what's happened to me, right? The Labour Party, which once represented um many of the interests, some people said it didn't because it was a bit reformist, but anyway, many of the interests of the Labour, organized Labour, trade unions and others. They lost that relationship. So in a way, they're even more estranged from the public. They're, they're even more susceptible now to say that everyone's like a Nazi or everyone's a bit scummy because they they don't, they have a relationship with latte. It's a caricature, but they're, it's mainly students and elitist metropolitan members, right? And it's a cliche, but it's kind of the problem with the cliches. It's kind of true. They don't have deep roots with working people anymore. So they're very estranged to them. But similarly, if you used to look at the Conservative Party, or you look at Westminster, they'd have all sorts of people, right? They'd have actual steel workers. They'd have shop. I mean, look, Margaret Thatcher, daughter of a shopkeeper. They'd have all sorts of people. And they don't anymore. Westminster's become a kind of very amorphous blob of similar looking people that have gone to similar schools. And they all have special advisors, spads, they're called... Yeah. So we've lost that trajectory and that big battle between what people think about society. What kind of vision can we have? Should we have a more small, conser small conservative one where you have like the God and the country and those traditional ideas? Or should you have ones that are more about, you know, radical ideas and transformative? And some of those things still look like they're going on, but they're really hollowed out. They're empty. And most share sadly at the moment this sense that the public are the problem and so we got quite a historic challenge i don't think it's all set up just to keep them all sweet ironically of course what happens is it does just allow people just to bobble along if people go or well, that's just it but what i always say to people about a plan or not plan because this is important and that together we don't all agree right we've got many different ideas even on our board and our steering group but i'm like it don't matter if we don't all agree it's what we do here, because let's imagine you're right and this is all a plan by some people or what I'm saying might be right in this instance, that they've got all these reasons why these things have come about and they're historic. And they're, and there are, of course, people who've got interests that would love it, but it's not that they've just sat in a room and gone bomb, 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 right? Mm -hmm. 
But it doesn't matter which one's right, because if we, like with a mandate or anything, he could say Carl Schwab or anyone could say anything, the WEF or anywhere. But if we in Britain say we're not having that and we're just organising and we stop it, it doesn't really matter what anyone's, who's The, the right. trouble is that, you know, WEF House has already said that they have penetrated and infiltrated pretty much every Western um, government. Yeah, well, they have definitely had all of the people in youth leading projects. They organise these things, but I wouldn't give too much value to them. What they do is they reflect a mirror of the ideas of the elite in each of those key nation states. So they are a kind of multiplier effect of getting them all together, right? Because in the end, they're conferences and ideas. And the problem is the vacuous nature of leadership and the fact that people hold on to these ideas because they're not being under pressure and they have no real relationship to the public. Because once you start forcing them, you see how quickly they come into line. If you look at the net zero conversation. Once they start thinking, we're losing Uxbridge, I can't believe Labour didn't win and the Tories are, oh God, yeah, what, the ULES thing, that is a thing. Then And you had like um, trade unions, the GMB telling Labour, listen, ULES is a problem for us. I don't know what planet you're on. And net zero, net zero is a problem for net us. Net zero is just an anti-human agenda. It is, but what I'm saying is people are those elite that would just keep regurgitating and saying it, they're rowing back on it now because mm. they're like, uh, um, yeah, all right. And also how are you going to implement it? And you put pressure on them and you say you ain't getting voted in mm. and you have lots of press and attack. All of a sudden, we can, the irony about things now is we can have a much bigger impact now because things are so decayed and decadent with all those guys. I mean, that's the thing I would say. So, yeah, I mean, it's the, the thing is we can have lots of ideas about why it's there. And we don't have to all fall out about it either. That's the thing, right? It's really important that we go, look, look, cool. You think that, I think that's sweet. But as long as we can agree that these principles on autonomy, bodily autonomy, on freedom of speech, on the right to congregate. Freedom of movement. All of that stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So it, it does amaze me to this day that Sadiq Khan is still in power. You know, because this has been going for some time now, and he's got to be one of the most disliked mayors in London history. <laughs> it's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Well, the thing is, he's still got ground game. I don't. I wouldn't underestimate Steve Khan. I think everyone has done that from day one. I remember when he first stood, and everyone thought a lot of people thought it would be David Lammy, and then people sort of disregarded him. But he's always had ground game. He's got a good ground game with people who are uh, campaigners and activists, right? Where the what's happened now is is they are nervous. There's no doubt about it, uh, and uh, I think that it's going to be it's going to be interesting. Look, um, he is disliked by certain people. There's a kind of there's the donut in London as well, right? There's the outer boroughs and there's cent inner London, and they off it it reflects them way like it did with Brexit. It's different, right? There are different type of aspirations and hopes and commitments in those ways. I think. I mean, I could say a lot about the whole mayoral election in, in London and elsewhere, right? I mean, if you look in Manchester and Bristol and all that, I mean, one of the things is why do we even have the evolution in the first place? It's partly because people lost enthusiasm for politics, local politics, local councillors were not generating interest. People had stopped getting involved and like with national politics, but not quite as much because mm. it's a different dynamic. And so this was a sense you get a mayor in and you make it a bit more like New York or Chicago and you get and the idea that you get more democratic accountability. But like I keep saying to everyone in Scotland, if you think that because I live in London, that Sadiq Khan listens to me any more than, than the national government listens to you, you're wrong. Mm. <laughs> He's not listening. Well, so the thing is, it's not about local accountability democratically. And it's an issue. And the more people push for more devolution, what they're really saying is we don't want to have this big discussion on a national level and have to address it in the sovereign nation with the whole of the people and win it over. We want to pass it off and do it in certain areas where we have strongholds. And even the name, even even the name devolution is so ironic because if you think of the word evolution, which is almost <laughs> progressing, isn't it? Yeah. Going from one to another. Devolution has it's got to be going backwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it will, be, it will be, it will be interesting. I mean, what we're, the thing is about all of this is that whilst we uh, do support people who stand independently in different places and we encourage people to get involved and all that, we are 
continuing with our main point, which is that whoever gets in and whatever they say, because you've got to remember you've got all these civil servants, you've got all these other people who basically start blocking things, right? Because they think they somehow they are really important now, right? Mm. Not people who've been voted in by the British people. You can't make it up. So we need to make ourselves stronger, the public, like flex our muscles. We have to get our voice to hold them accountable. And, you know, in a range of areas, we're continuing to do that. We're having not just regular meetings and events. We've got a, uh, a cabinet where people in a range of areas on the environment, on law and order, on carers, uh, on the economy, on social, the social arena. But also we're looking at a, a range of other uh, initiatives at the moment. We've got some big plans that we're going to be announcing soon about stuff that we're doing in different cities. Um, we're going to make sure that we're going to be here to defend and uphold uh, the hard won liberties and rights. And I think that if we can, you know, just we, we can all do a little test. We can experiment it. I mean, you know, we know that when we all get people, as soon as you start getting more than about 30 people emailing and calling and writing letters to their MPs and councillors, it starts having an effect. You get over 100, you get over 200. You start getting more than that. It's because a lot of councillors are only voted in by a few hundred people. And MPs and central party headquarters get very nervous. Let's build something new. Let's make ourselves the thing that people have to um, address. And that, that without us saying that's all right, they can't get in. That's, I think, a great aspiration that we said, people say, oh, what are we going to do? And you all, yeah, we all have to get together. But this new party is fine. But like, let's make ourselves strong enough that we can have a real directional influence on things and we've seen it happen in the continent we should remember like the truckers were one thing but the farmers have had an enormous impact particularly in the netherlands you've got the bbb lots of things have come out of all this stuff we live in very very interesting slightly precarious but also exciting times lots of things are up for grabs that never used to be mm. but it's also with the word of caution it can be dangerous times so it's going to be again it's up to us how do we want to make it Exactly. I mean, I have said that 2024 is going to be a pivotal year now to see which which way we go. Definitely. But yeah. I, I am optimistic. Well, I, I don't want to make it a spectator sport. So I think that you, I think I live in the realms of all of those things, pessimism and optimism, and just trying to take a, a, a pragmatic, balanced view. Mm. I have the hope and belief and the conviction of knowing that people are decent, and I know that, right? And I've seen it. It's because what happens, right? Because when we go to different areas, you see ordinary people that are involved, and they're extraordinary. I call them ordinary people, they're proper, right? So you've got people that have got their little businesses or bigger businesses, and they've got their residents, and they're really articulate, and they're really smart. And you're like, God, these people should be running things here. They've organized, and they're doing things. And I'm like, we meet all these brilliant people, and this is the thing, right? The, the technocrats don't quite understand this. The more they keep doing this, the more they keep tightening the wrench, the more it infuriates people in different areas. And it doesn't allow people to get on with their daily lives, right? which is what most people want to do. Right? They want to mm -hmm. get on with things. They want something better for their kids. They'd like to have a bit of a night. It's not a diss. It, why wouldn't you want that? Right? That's what everyone wants, okay? a decent life. They want a life. They don't want to just exist. Right. But we're not having it allowed. And these constant nudges and coercion and impositions are throwing up some brilliant people that everyone's getting to work, and people that weren't necessarily all going to work together, right? And that's going to keep happening. So it's not a spectator sport. It will be interesting, but what will be really important is how we intersect with it, how we inter you know, inform that, how we win over some things. And yeah, I think, again, without sounding like monotonous, I, we'd love everyone to get involved with together but even if you don't get involved with together set up your own thing in your local area have your voice heard make your presence known right it is if we want to talk about what's infectious that is really infectious absolutely because i mean you've got um colchester council watch now um we've got our own thetford council watch yes you know so a lot of people are taking more of an interest on what's going on and people are wanting to get their voices heard more so i think we're on the right tracks yeah definitely yeah. i think that's no, good and they, they, those guys in particular that you just mentioned both of that sets of people have done really it's really good and it's really great when you see people holding those councillors and others to account and they're looking embarrassed and awkward they've never had it happen in their life mm. just we got right people forget this like 30 40 years ago that was just called politics people would argue and discuss and they thrash it out and they say things and they went 
And yeah, it hasn't happened. People have become so used to just getting on with things in back rooms and doing things and not being held accountable, right? So these are really positive steps forward. Um, and I think like with the, you know, it doesn't matter what things are coming out. The COVID, uh, the, sorry, the um, the uh, CDU, which is part of the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, is all these acronyms, but the Counter Disinformation Unit is now being held a little bit accountable at last because during lockdowns, they had spy units and censoring groups on citizens, on journalists, on medics, many of the people we all know, um, all of us. And, you know, quite rightly, the people, some of the governing, some of the people that are over, doing oversight on those uh, groups are saying this is unacceptable. We need to review this and make it clear. This has all come about through people making a big noise about it. Right. Even some of the people in the press that have pr printed it didn't want to do some of it at first till they saw a lot of work that was presented to them by a few key groups. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing a lot of positive results and a lot of wins in a world in which is going in a direction of more control, surveillance. And, and the question is, how much are we going to shape it? How much can we do? And we make the world every day. And so, you know, we do it every day. It's us, right? It's no one else. And, you know, Shelley's sort of, ye are the many, they are the few. We should keep reminding ourselves of all of that. Yeah, 100%. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Right. To end it, I just want to... Because I think mental health is an important issue in all of this as well. And you do what I'm not brave enough to do yet. And that is you cold, you swim in cold water, don't you? You're, you're <laughs> yeah. doing your, are you a big fan of Wim Hof? I am, yeah. yeah. I'm a big How, fan. How's that going? His, I'm a massive fan of his method. Just to say, and thanks for asking this question, because it, it's like, right, this is a, it's been really important for me. And, um, you know, he, Wim Hof tells his story, he's got his story, but one of the reasons for why he did, he did was he had a personal tragedy and people can look mm. that up. It's not my story to tell, but he, but the cold water helped him get on. I mean, it's truly a very, very tragic situation, but also in the depths of tragedy, you can get enormous transformation and potential and hope and beauty. Inspiration. Right? He became someone completely different, as you would do through what he mm. went through, but also that gave some new light and scope on a whole new world, right? And, and you know, these are—I'm using these words. What happened was a lot. It was not a little thing. So, but so nothing like that for me, except to say that um, I think, like everyone, the lockdowns were a lot, right? And and I allowed myself to do all sorts of things to to, to let myself, you say, let myself go, but do things, you know, and I was. You know, and, and the cold water is a brilliant, brilliant thing. It's exciting. Inflammation is one of the big issues for us in the West. Inflammation internally in a range of areas, all the cardiovascular stuff and everything, strokes and but just ossification of the of the, you know, all the veins and the cells. But it makes you get a top buzz as well. It's just an incredible buzz. It's like a meditation for the body. It gets all the blood circulating, shooting once it's gone to the vital organs. And you get you, you can get a real sense of when I let my mind you talk about mental health. I mean, a lot of the time in in the recent period, in the last 20 or 30 years, I, I sometimes think we've presented too much in terms of the realms of mental health and taken it out of the social sphere which is handy for the people that have been running things because they we're all like if we're all vulnerable and at risk and having to see you know like see the problems not in terms of what's happened with our pay or surveillance but with our own internal dialogue that's good for them but notwithstanding it's not it, it's nuanced and it's not it's not just one thing or the other because it is the case that many people have been impacted by what's happened then in the last few years in particular particularly young people and that we are sentient psychological emotional beings right and, and in in a realm where we haven't been as connected as we have been in the past with networks and with strong communities we do feel things much more at an insular isolated level and it does impact much more you only have to look at suicides of young men yeah, definitely right it's such a terrible number and statistic and if ever i could we can do stuff that can help inspire and do that and show a way more and encourage people I, i'd love to do that but so i love the cold water do you I mean, do the breathing I, as well? Yeah, I, I do do the breathing. I most right, recently I haven't been doing it enough recently, but I have done for quite a long time. I was doing the breathing really regularly. It's brilliant. 
and I also do some hot stuff, some of the hot yoga or hot in the in the steam. Sauna. Yeah, because that's what and, people tend to do. They tend to do the the sauna, yeah. then they'll jump into an ice cold. Yeah, and it's that shock therapy, isn't it? Really, it's great, and also it's the brown cells that build up that are good for you, and it's also building up certain things in your fat and your veins and you're going out and then also some cardiovascular strength stuff and i i've got someone who's very good who's been helping uh out i we i can post their details afterwards if people want to have a look at them yeah well yeah. if you've got any links that you'd like me to share i'll put those in the video description so cool, just send them great. over to me and i'll be more than happy to do that but i'd encourage everyone to do it and one of the things is that it is true that when you're working hard if you're grafting and it's non-stop and you're in your brain a lot and you're like how do we do this and it's really important that this is a marathon, guys. This is not a sprint. We've seen that. And I, uh, during, in the middle of all the lockdowns, and we were responding to everything, I was like, right, guys, they've got us on the back foot for everything. They And that stuff had all been, they were executing it bit by bit. And you were like, and I'm like, now we need to get in a groove where we can underwrite our timeline and we don't just become overwhelmed because it is tiring this stuff right and they people rely on us falling down so there's an element in which it's part of our responsibility as well i mean plato talked about the tripartite division between the mind body and soul physicality and all of that and i think those things are really important to think about how we engage how we sort of fulfill ourselves sustain the things we do we are, you know in, in the middle of the whole scotland tour we we were doing all that we were going ice water we were like going hiking uh and people loved it in scotland so scotland's such a beautiful country of course right but oh, people are proud of, you know yeah Carl, we went to ben nevis we went to loch lomond all the key but some the, that stuff and we were often on the coasts here and yeah, do it as well. I do it with Danny Ramlin. Your viewers will all know Danny Ramlin. I'm down in Hastings or on the coast there in Sussex and saw Dorset or whatever. I'm, I'm often have a swim with him. He's a good pal and a fellow warrior together, key founding member. But you know, that, that you know, set a group up that go cold swimming and then do also stuff around civil liberties. That's a good thing to do. There's <laughs> lots of lots of ways to um to do things, you know. No, that's brilliant. Well, listen, thank you very much for your time. Um Really enjoyed having a conversation. I hope everyone watching has enjoyed this as well. Thank um, you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, mate. Thank, much thanks really for having me. It. I really appreciate it. All the best. Cheers, Thank buddy. You. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye.